Good morning, everyone. No, it's afternoon by now, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you for coming along to hear about Design Eye Creative Paper on Skin. Uh, my name's Lyndall Thorne, and I know at least, I, f I feel like it's such an intimate little group. I, I should know your name. Uh, Judy Jackson. Judy, hello. And the other person is? Mark. Mark and Melissa? Yes. yes. And? Catherine. Catherine, hi. Um, so, a, a little bit about me and, and why I'm here. Uh, this story probably starts in the year 1940, actually, because um, my mother is actually the concept originator of Design Eye Creative Paper on Skin. And she was born in 1940 uh, and lived in South Burnie for all her all of her childhood and some of her adult life as well. Now, um, I don't know if many of you travelled through Burnie during the last five decades of the last century, but the feature industry, of course, was the dirty, smelly pulp mill. And uh, my mother literally grew up in the shadows of the smokestacks and uh, used to go down to the South Burnie beach and frolic in the pollution edged um, uh, waves and I, I actually, uh, someone handed me some relics and I think these were written, they were in the Australian probably in about the late 70s and um, they call Burnie the dirtiest city in Australia. <laughs> in fact, if you didn't know Bernie was in northern Tasmania, the town's putrid, nauseating beaches, its lung-searing air, its acid-bleached rivers and red-stained coastline would probably have you believing you were somewhere in the third world where pollution controls are non-existent. Bernie is a little-known national disgrace where heavy industry has, for decades, released millions of tonnes of noxious and toxic waste into the air and water. So... <laughs> That's what the perception of Bernie was way back then. And um, I guess what happened when the pulp mill and a number of those other heavy industries closed in the 1990s, there was a, a huge risk that, um, that Bernie would just disappear into an economic black hole. And what the town did through some really fabulous um, and progressive community consultation was dug itself out of that hole to become much more of a cultural centre throughout that transformation. And um, what we began to realise as Paper on Skin developed was that uh, this event is emblematic of Bernie's cultural and economic transformation. It's got those really um, strong links with Bernie's papermaking past, but it shows how, how that doesn't have to be, that dirty, smelly industry anymore that paper making and paper and the ingenuity and innovation behind that science and that art form can become something like this. So Pam's idea for a wearable paper art competition started probably in about 2011 when Greg Leong was the director of the Bernie Regional Art Gallery and of course an event like this is absolutely in his wheelhouse. He has a a background in textile and opera and performance, so he just said yes straight away to this. Uh, we never themed the competition. What we wanted was wearable paper art, and it was always going to be in the gallery and was so for its first four iterations. We had the gala event in the gallery and an exhibition in the gallery. And during the gala event, of course, that was when the judging would take place and the awards were announced. Uh, heading up towards its third iteration, because it's a biennial event in 2016, uh, that's when I became involved because I could see that it was really stressing my mother out. <laughs> and and the, the, the event was growing and it needed someone to pay attention to things like social media and websites and um, online applications and profile building and all of that. Uh, so, so I've been involved really for the past three iterations. So if we go to the next um, slide, so uh, it really is and always has been very much family affair. So 
I've explained the connection um, with my mother, uh, but this chap on the right-hand side here is my father. And um, two weeks ago, he died in my arms. So um, that's a, a grief that I'm feeling at the moment, still pretty fresh. He, this was last year, last June. Uh, he was actually quite deep in treatment uh, at that time, but he was still there making things like he has done all our lives with various art projects that my mother and I kind of dive into. And uh, some of you might know Randolph as well on the right-hand side. So Randolph was the uh, exhibitions uh, manager at the Burnie Regional Art Gallery and there's a little bit of compounded grief because uh, in May this year the Burnie City Council made some dis very controversial decisions uh, which involved closing four of our cultural venues and um, sacking 16 staff. So all of the wonderful knowledge that Randolph had and um, the other employees of the council in those venues uh, has walked out the door now. So I'll try not to let my talk veer into that discussion because it has sort of railroaded my life over the past few months. So there's two other S words. I, I, I talked about this presentation being um, the sweet spot. That's really Bernie's paper making uh, lineage and how uh, that has a lot of meaning and resonance for uh, the people of Burnie, but also it's, it's a very authentic um, place-based event and, and that's, that's also very attractive for a prospective entrance and people who come to Burnie to see the exhibition because Burnie's collection is very much based on paper. Uh, as Melissa would know, we have the Bernie Print Prize on the off year uh, when paper on skin isn't happening. Fingers crossed that will continue. Um, so that's uh, that. That's the the sweet spot. It's it's its placement within the context of Bernie and uh, Bernie's history. Um, now, in in 2018. Uh, just after that, our, our 2018 event, uh, Burnie City Council decided that they would like to support an event and, um, and the event that they chose to support was Paper on Skin. And they actually funded myself and Jenny Cox, who was the events manager at the time, to head to New Zealand to see the huge world of wearable art over there. Has anyone been to the world of wearable art in Wellington? <laughs> Isn't it amazing? So, so that's held in a three and a half thousand seat auditorium. Not paper based, so they can do cartwheels in their costumes. We can't. Um, you can roll the, um, the, so this will just be on a slideshow now, that all of these images taken by Grant Wells were during um, the filming last year, which is what we flicked to when we couldn't do the live event. Uh, and there's some catwalk shots as well. Uh, so, so, in other words, uh, the, the trajectory from the 2018 event to the 2020 event was going to be all about developing paper on skin. And we, from, after we came back from WOW, we had all of 2019 and we, we were, were working really hard on how we could make this fabulous, unforgettable uh, evening gala event because, you know, we, we really could tell that, that the entries were great in 2018 and in 2020 we, we thought it was also something to be very excited about. And we got people like Claire Spillman involved to come and stage manage and Nick Higgins, who's uh, a lighting designer of some note. And roll on to 2019 and, you know, round about the 17th of March, I, I got the phone call from the then Arts and Function Centre manager that everything was going to be cancelled um, for the next four months at least. Now, I'm sure that Ben drew the short straw in terms of when that decision was made at the executive manager's meeting that morning of who was going to call Lindall and <laughs> inform her that this thing we'd been working so hard towards by that stage wasn't going to happen. Uh, and I knew that the communications were going to go out 
from the council within a few hours that, that all uh, scheduled events for the Arts and Function Centre were going to be cancelled. So I had to make a very quick decision about what we might do and the first person that I called was Nick who was going to be our lighting designer but he has screen credentials as well and I said, look Nick, it's not going to happen, could we film it? And he said yes and on the basis of that three letter word, <laughs> we um, it set us on this trajectory of filming Paper on Skin last year. Just to give an idea of the timing, we were at that stage in the middle of March, all the entries had been received and the judges were in pre-selection. So what I knew was that my vision had already been realised because I'd had a sneak preview, obviously, of what the entries were looking like and um, I just didn't want to let that opportunity go, especially considering that at that stage it was looking very likely that there were going to be a whole lot of people all around the world at home, in their studios and our artists are very resourceful, so even if they couldn't go out and get stuff, I, I knew that they'd be able to make some pretty amazing works because uh, often they're um, recycling and reusing and repurposing their gear anyway. Um, so that's what we committed to and it was a pretty interesting journey. It was a little bit like I think there's a scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark when you're running along and everything's collapsing <laughs> behind you. But, you know, I'd, I'd committed to it. As long as we could get the, get the things here, um, an international post or, and freight didn't shut down, we could just hold them until we could get... Uh, well, we really needed about 20 people in a room to be able to do that. So as soon as the limits for non-essential gatherings uh, increased from, well, it was two for a little while in Burnie, um, and then it went to 10 and then it went to 20, I knew we'd be right. I knew we'd be able to film it. We, we had to have a very forensic schedule because there were only, you know, a certain number of people that could be there. So, um, uh, and, and really, I need to pay due credit to Claire, who's here, who was our floor manager. And, you know, there's this thing called a skill set. And when someone walks in and they have that skill set and is exactly what you need, then you, you need to acknowledge it. So, a, a, a lot of what you see happening here happens smoothly within time on schedule um, because of this woman here. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Um, we had things like costumes that couldn't walk up the stairs to get onto the platform, <laughs> so we had to, to dress them uh, behind screens. But, you know, once again, uh, a lot of logistics, which our, our team, with the help of the Arts and Function Centre staff as well, um, uh, managed to pull off and it was a real community coming together. So many other things got cancelled and stopped and shut down and it was almost like this beacon, this shining light and I actually received a lot of feedback from the artists as well, uh, you know, thanking, I mean, they, they made these incredible works but they were thanking us for persisting and continuing with the event because Many of these garments take hundreds and hundreds of hours to make and it, and it gave them an anchor as well and, and got them through those dark and strange times. Um, it, speaking of things closing, um, <laughs> ordinarily we use the Burnie Regional Art Gallery as our delivery point, uh, but that closed and there were not going to be any staff there. It was the middle of winter. We didn't want cardboard boxes full of paper garments to be sitting outside in the rain, so we changed the delivery address to uh, my parents' house for, <laughs> for various reasons. I was there as well, so um, yeah, that one just then, like some of these garments are big, so as 30 or so tumbled in, uh, 
our occupation of the space became smaller and smaller. So we had to unpack them and check them out and, and have fittings. We had all these gorgeous young models sort of coming in and, and trying them all on. So look, it was, it was fun and games, but uh, we, we managed to, to get the thing filmed almost at the time where we would have had the live event had it gone ahead. And the exhibition, I think, also ran for the scheduled numbers of um, the scheduled dates that it was due to run. And we were even able to have a live premiere of the film, which was really exciting. It was the first time the um, Arts and Function Centre had had a live event since the shutdown. So it was a love... <laughs> There's Stewie moving by hand. Revolve, and, and if you if you watch that film, um, that's the shot. Like he is behind that costume. I shouldn't be telling you the trade secrets, but you can't see him because it's got a it's got a girth at the bottom of that costume. And it's actually still underneath my parents' house in a in a box. <laughs> it has to go back to Germany, and the lady hasn't got organised to um, get that sorted yet. Um, so, so yeah, it was it was amazing to have the the live event, the premiere of the film, um, because there was our community sitting in the space where this thing had been made, and it's not often that, you know, a film of this calibre, uh, you know, really high quality, very very innovative, uh, telling amazing stories with. Um, art of a world-class standard was made in that tiny little theatre in Burnie. Uh, and, and there was a real palpable sense of pride, I think, from the community that night that, that this had happened. And, you know, in terms of swings and roundabouts, um, whilst we had to let go of some things in order to do this, we had the Arts and Function Centre all to ourselves. So um, for that reason, uh, it gave us scope to do the, the best that we could within the, the COVID-induced challenges that we were operating under. And you know, another silver lining, of course, is that we'd never had video footage before. We'd only had still photography. And suddenly, um, with a, a competition that had uh, seven countries represented, an hour after the premiere of the film in Burnie, we, we pressed go on the uh, Vimeo and, and the film, we actually made a suite of films in the end, uh, the film went out to the world. So rather than a diminished experience, design I creative paper on Skin 2020 uh, actually took us to a whole other level of reach and international exposure. So that's the surprise. And, um, and, and that continues on and will feed into what we want to do next year as well. In terms of uh, the, the third component uh, that are scheduled to talk about, that's, that was running to keep up. Uh, and perhaps I'll just talk a little bit about um, how I see the evolution of the event. So, you know, we, we've always had very high quality um, works. Uh, in, the, in those first few iterations, though, you, you could tell that it was mainly textile artists who were substituting textile techniques for the creation of a paper garment. Um, and, and at about, about 2016, we got our first really good suite of images together and put them on the website. And what I could tell uh, when we did the call for entries for 2018 was that people had been able to study those pieces and by the time the entries rolled in for 2018, we were looking at something very different. They were starting to, they were starting to get our competition, that, that it wasn't paper dresses that looked a bit like textile dresses, only they were made of paper, that we were, we were most excited that we were getting wearable paper art. Um, so they were really deconstructing the whole idea of a garment. And also um, it was very satisfying to, to see that they were uh, 
really stretching the boundaries of what this incredible medium of paper can do because it has such diverse uses and and it's also paper you know for centuries has been used for carrying messages and um, one of the things that that I personally love about paper on skin are the stories that people tell through the works and um, I'll often shed a few tears when I'm reading artist statements about what the various works mean and you know, one year, uh, two artists, uh, their studio was flooded in um, ex-cyclone Yazi up on the north, northern New South Wales coast. And they salvaged a whole lot of handmade paper from their studio and made a piece called Flood. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of people here who understand that, that making art can be a special kind of alchemy and, and magic and they really appreciated that healing journey that they went through in making that piece. Um, so so that, was, that was 2018 and there was also um, a, a stronger uh, awareness of handmade paper and use of handmade paper as well. Now, uh, as the standard of entries uh, kind of climbed every year, we, we did introduce, because of those those um, evolving features of the event and the standard of entries climbing, we did introduce a, a couple more awards for 2020. And one of those was an encouragement award, just so that people wouldn't look at the event and say, well, you know, that's out of my league. Um, I'll do the best that I can and I might be in for a shot with the encouragement award. Just better check my time. Um, and, and, and that was won by a fabulous Queensland artist this year called Denise Lambie, who resurrected something like 3,000 tea bags from going into her compost bin, like emptied out the tea and worked on these papers and just made the most beautiful things. So it was, you know, tea bags from shoes to incredible headdress. Uh, so she was a very worthy winner. And we also wanted to acknowledge the fact that people were um, entering garments made from paper that they had made themselves. So not only was there incredible artistry in their design and, and skill in their execution, but they had demonstrated a whole other skill set by making the paper. So we also introduced a handmade paper award. Which, well, handmade paper, non-commercial paper, artisanal paper, and um, the lady that won that uh, last year won for a very original piece. She didn't actually make the paper, but um, it was made from artisanal paper. And um, she's very happy that she won $500 worth of uh, awagami, uh, beautiful washi paper from Japan. And she said, I'm just gonna use it for the next event anyway. Uh, so um, next year, I can't say too much about it because we, we haven't sort of locked it down yet, but we'd actually like to do something to um, be able to showcase the incredible innovation and ingenuity that the artists are really demonstrating through their works now. I guess what, what we learned through 2020 was that uh, wearable paper art is has become an art form in and of itself, as we can see in these pieces. And you know, just being able to to see more about the process or some of the prototypes that the artists have been working on as they shape up their final garment would be something I think that a lot of people would be interested in. Um, so. On account of what's happened in Burnie over the last few months with the cuts and, and closures, uh, we will be relocating to have the event in Devonport next year. We haven't sort of really announced that or launched that publicly yet, but a few more people know now. <laughs> uh, what, what we... Uh, fairly quickly decided to do once we knew that the Arts and Function Centre may not have been available and the gallery would definitely be closed was look for the place that uh, best suited, had the best facilities 
for this event, which we also think will have um, a lot more interest next year because of this surprise that happened <laughs> uh, with, with releasing the film and getting a lot more eyes on it. Uh, and so for that reason, we will, we will have our event in the Devonport Convention Centre. I think it's the 17th of June next year and the exhibition will be at the Devonport Regional Gallery. And it's, it's not a dislocating kind of decision because Jeff Dobson, who's the uh, manager of the Paranapal Arts Centre, he was the director of the Burnie Regional Art Gallery for... I think two of Paper on Skin iterations, so he knows us, he knows the event really well. Begita, who pretty much manages the gallery at Devonport, she um, worked at uh, Burnie in the gallery there for I think the first three iterations of Paper on Skin and she did all the sort of IT and admin support for it. So they were like, come to us, <laughs> we said, I think we will. <laughs> and uh, so, so that's where we're at. We're starting to plan for 2022 and um, it's all very exciting. So thank you for listening and does anyone have any questions? And if you could just wait for Amina to bring the microphone to you if you do have questions. Need some hold music. <laughs> um, it's fantastic work, fantastic artwork. I see it as art, artwork. Was it um, international artists yes. or international artists yes. as well as Australian? Yep, yep, it was. Um, and, and that was another surprise that we actually managed to get almost all of the international works here. So we had 33 entries. And look, to be honest, in those early days, the decision to film it was really if, if we can get a record of the 2020 event, then I'll be happy. I thought we might get half of our artists up to being able to produce a piece and get it to Bernie, because no one knew what was going to happen then. Uh, there's no um, dousing Nick Higgins' ambitions. You know, the first meeting that we, we had in the Arts and Functions, and he's like, well, we're going to have to have a stage, we're going to need 10 days. I'd never made a film before. I didn't know that it required all that kind of structural and logistical planning and thinking. But, you know, from that, from that point on, I was like, no, we are making a film. We're not just going to chuck these things on a model and, you know, wave a camera over them. Um, and, and so in answer to your question, we had one artist who sent his three pieces, three pieces, off in very good time from the US and we waited and we waited and we waited and uh, the, the Arts and Function Centre actually agreed to keep the set up in place for an extra week because they didn't come by the time we were scheduled to finish shooting. And at one of our little debriefs, we all checked our calendars and we had a couple of um, sort of two hour slots in the coming week in case they showed up in time for filming, that they didn't. When they did show up though, we, we got our photographer to take stills photographs of them and so they are still included in the film, but in, in a montage. Uh, and there was one piece from Romania as well. Romania shut down all their postal services. And, and I literally cried when I saw that piece because it was so beautiful and it would have just fitted so well in the mix of the 30. Uh, but it's actually now, it did end up getting on a plane. It's actually showing at an exhibition in the US at the moment. So, do you think you're going to do the film process again? Do you, after this experience, do you think it add actually to the process or the showing of the exhibition, perhaps the growth, international growth and all? Yes, we are. You know, that's the plan at this stage, to film the works again. So, you know, it, it is a very involved, a very expensive, um, resource demanding type of project. But, you know, we'll, we were pretty happy with what we were able to do under those sort of circumstances. So those who are involved um, would really like to have another shot at it with perhaps a bit more time to plan and, and think about it. And it, 
you know, if you think about WOW, um, which is the, you know, the huge event in an arena setting, and you're, you're a long way from the garments. So when we went to WOW, we went two consecutive nights. So, you know, once we were right up and saw the whole spectacle, the show, and, and then we got way down close for the second night, and you could actually see the detail. And all my favourites from the first night changed once I saw the detail. And, and that's what we're able to provide via the filming. Yeah, just, you know, to really get up close and, and see some of the, you know, incredibly fine detail that, that, that is the iceberg of work um, in any art piece. But, you know, there's something especially entrancingly mad about wearable art artists. <laughs> I think they will, they will go the extra mile. I mean, look at that. That was just the headpiece. <laughs> Uh, and that it was funny when the delivery guy came with that huge um, South American uh, inspired piece. He said, "Look, I've got I've got two really big boxes for you, <laughs> but they're really light." <laughs> he, he was so confused. Where can we see that film? If you go to the Bernie Arts Council website uh, it's it's the, the main film is on the home page uh, but along the top navigation bar there's a tab called the films and all the others are there as well so we we release the, the, the main film with all the pieces uh, is 54 minutes and then we slice it into four short films and, and then we also released all the individual clips as well. And, and that's been great to be able to just give those to the artists to use as well. I know that a lot of them have already used them for submissions for um, exhibitions and competitions as well. So there's a lot of flow on benefits, I think, for investing in something like this. There's one more. Hello. Um, my name's Cheryl Mundy. Hi, I'm a Pakana woman. You Northwest Coasters. <laughs> <sighs> I want to thank you. You have brought to life and allowed me to see and feel everything you've spoken about. And to me, I suspect that means you're a person who knows and loves the artists, the creators and all of the support mechanism around it. You can feel it oh, when you, you talk. The other thing is thank you, because I've got ideas popping everywhere <laughs> in my head, but maybe I'm going to have to come and talk to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and a last thing, because you mentioned it, I acknowledge the passing of your father, and I congratulate you for your resilience in being here, and I thank you for everything you've given me. I've felt everything that you said, and I could picture the people, not by looking there because I'm too blind, <laughs> um, but from what you were saying, I could see mm. what was going on. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Any other questions? I, I really appreciate that feedback at this time too. Thank you. Yeah. And if you, anyone wants to talk to me about doing a um, caring for a body and doing a, a burial without the use of a funeral director at all, um, then come and see me because we did that last week and we pulled it off and he's um, buried in a shroud in a shallow grave at the Waratah Cemetery and it absolutely confounded every bureaucrat and health professional that we dealt with but it is absolutely doable and legal. Um, it, it's not without its challenges because the system is set up to do something very different and put a lot of money in funeral directors' pockets. Uh, <laughs> but um, it was a uh, very sad but very healing and lovely process to do that. That's my little PS to my talk. <laughs> All right, that's probably time. Yeah.